Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome to another video by Bacho. It's the best and worst films of 2022 uh, tier ranking thingamajig. For some ungodly reason, you think this content is good. Therefore, here I am again. Before we get started, I just want to preface that this is just a silly list. Don't take it too seriously. There is no objective, definite way to measure one film against another. It's the same with number ratings. They're just extremely flimsy and they're only really done for a bit of fun. I don't take it too seriously. I don't overthink what I rate a film on Letterboxd. It's all a bunch of bullshit, really. So if you take it seriously, you're probably a massive idiot. And also with regards to this list that I'm about to unveil to you, it's always constantly changing in my head is extremely fluid. This doesn't reflect my permanent final view of all these films. It's the furthest thing from definitive. The order of the list will literally have changed in my mind by the time I start editing this. Before we begin, I'd just like to comment on the year 2022 as a whole with regards to what films came out. I'd say it was a year of imperfection, but I mean that in a good way. There are a lot of films in my top 20 that are almost masterpieces, but just rough around the edges. Not everything is 100% refined as a piece of art. A lot of the films that have so many special things about them, but just don't quite hit the nail on the head. A lot of films that maybe just go on for too long, a lot of films that maybe just have a weak first, second or third act. But I sort of enjoyed all these films for their imperfections. They still implanted themselves in my mind as special things. They each provided a very unique experience that added to 2022. It was also quite a good year for horror. There are a lot of uh, good horror films on this list. The horror renaissance continues. And by the way, I just want to say that I'm using IMDb as a reference for what films qualify as 2022 movies. It's pretty simple. If the year in brackets next to the title on the film's IMDb page is 2022, it qualifies. If not, uh, no dice. I'm sorry about that uh, Marcel Lachelle with shoes on. You can fuck off. Also, this is a numbered list, but there are a vague range of tiers, and that is just a tier which is just 1 out of 10 to 10 out of 10. So somewhere on the screen, it'll say tier 1, which means tier 1 out of 10, which means I'm talking about films that are 1 out of 10, 2 out of 10, tier 2. Tier 9 is the films that I gave 9 out of 10, etc. It's pretty simple, actually, isn't it? All this goddamn explaining. But now that's all out of the way, I would say we should just crack on with it. I'm going in order of worst to best. At number 52, we have The School for Good and Evil. Now, I don't really know how much I can say about this one. I actually know someone who acted in this, so I feel kind of bad. But objectively, this is the worst film of 2022. I have to be honest, this film is pretty trash, but I don't really want to go into it. Sorry to disappoint, I know it's all this hype between, oh, what was the worst film that Macho saw, and you're going to tear it into shreds. But no, I can't. I'm 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 in an awkward position here. I have to abstain, I have to quell my sword or whatever the expression is. I'll just say shy Harry Potter with appalling writing and acting. Thousands of years you always gave the heroes the upper hand! I held the balance with you! Next up, number 51, Morbius. Now this is good because I don't know anyone who acted in this other than Jared Leto himself, but he's a prick, so I'm gonna roast him anyway. Honestly, I've been on so many nights out with that guy and he's just a uh, fucking nonce, mate. He just always goes off on this tangent about how how, like, the legal age would be lowered to 14 because at 14, girls are really mature. Oh, God, I don't even want to tell, go into it. I made a big 50-minute review of Morbius, so I'm going to keep this a bit brief. This is an embarrassing movie, a complete blunder when it comes to a studio trying to create something hip and, like, down with the times. It's like a bad superhero movie from the early 2000s. No one wanted this. Everyone could smell its quality from the trailers. It deserved to get memed because it was just so ridiculously, obviously bad. Fuck it. There's something inside of me. It wants to hunt. And consume blood. At number 50, we have Smile. At times, I suppose this was entertainingly bad because incompetent horror movies often provide for unintended bits of humour. They take themselves super seriously and think they're being much scarier than they actually are. So it is quite funny just to laugh at the embarrassment. It's another one of those cases where you can spot the quality of the film just from the trailer. I was never going to watch this if not for this video just to, like, add a few more shit films to the list. I saw the trailer so many times in the cinema, it was so annoying. That stupid bit in the car when that woman's head, like, bends down. Apparently, people legitimately found this scary, which profoundly depresses me. You shouldn't be able to talk about movies ever again if you thought this was a good film. The actor who plays A-Train from The Boys appeared in this, and he was 
god awful. He must be one of those actors who's entirely dependent on the script and or director. God, he was actually distractingly bad. There's nothing genuine, there's nothing original about this movie, it's utterly derivative. It's an amalgamation of all of the most cynical horror movie tropes. Hi. At number 49, we have Your Christmas or Mine. Oh yeah, baby, the iconic film from 2022. Me and the family wanted to watch like a cheesy film for Christmas. Nice, smaltzy, broad, crowd pleaser kind of thing. So this isn't a movie, this is a product. And I'm not even saying that in like a pretentious way. I don't, I don't think that's a pretentious statement. It's a product created by a Christmas movie algorithm. And I can't even be too angry with it because it succeeds at what it wanted to do. It just has no artistic integrity. Asa Butterfield is the great deceiver. He is the devil hiding underneath this facade of an innocent teenage boy. Be wary of him. This film does include what appear to be emotionally charged scenes, but make no mistake, these emotions are plastic. They were formulated in a lab filled with stoic business heads. It's a successful product, but an utterly empty piece of storytelling. You don't get to choose your family. But for my money, Christmas is the most important of all. At number 48, we have Windfall. I had to really dig deep into my mental archives to remember what this film is. So Windfall is a Netflix movie, and I usually stay well clear of Netflix original films, unless a talented director is attached to it. This film, to be fair, looked pretty, and Jesse Plemons was in it, and he's a good actor. I still avoided it, but then Mike Stoklasser of Red Letter Media, who is a man I respect greatly, he said that this was really good and gripping. So I watched it, and I came to the conclusion that Mike Stoklasser Classer is mentally retarded. On a cinematographic level and an atmospheric level, this film is fairly effective. So that there might be enough for some people, fair enough. But the acting and dialogue was appalling and obvious. Without a prior knowledge of Jesse Plemons' acting career, you legitimately could have assumed that he was just another one of these trash actors. He isn't flat, he isn't boring, he is incompetent in this. He sucks major dick in this. Jason Siegel, not to be confused with Steven Siegel, Seagull is also in this and he's that uh, goofy guy from How I Met Your Mother so when he does a serious acting role it's automatically very good and very profound. No it's not, he's at times competent in this I suppose but most of the time he's just flat. He's never been a good actor, make no mistake I remember forgetting Sarah Marshall and this was at an age of like 13, 14 where I had little to no critical thinking. He's completely unconvincing and wooden in everything he's in. Are you saying my dad's dead? My dad said? At number 47, we have Don't Worry Darling. Don't Worry Darling was a true nothing burger. Naive children trying their hand at topical social commentary. Florence Pugh was okay, however I don't want her to get typecast as this like woman who's always sad and in perilous situations as a result of like male oppression. It's getting a little bit old, I want her to do something else now. She's always just frowning on making this face look. Chris Pine phones it in. His character was based off of Jordan Peterson, whom the director, Olivia Wilde, did little to no research on in preparation for this film. I think she read like half a BuzzFeed article. So Pine's character is just nothing. This isn't a chaotically bad movie. It's just super middling and forgettable. And sometimes that can be worse. We'll be honest now and mention a positive. I thought the cinematography was good and like vibrant, but it was also purposeful. It wasn't just pretty for the sake of pretty. It's supposed to be this deceitfully paradisal world. That kind of worked well, visually. But apart from that, shit. That's what you're worried about? Our life. Alice, our life together. This. We could lose this. Number 46, Uncharted. This film is largely unnecessary. Beyond it being totally pointless, it's just a bland, Marvel-esque action movie. Completely corporate. Mark Wahlberg sucks, he clearly just didn't give a shit about this project. But Tom Holland, to his credit, he did an okay job. He actually put some energy into this. I didn't hate it, I actually found it quite easy to sit through. There were some decent action set pieces, although they were ripped straight from the game. 
just play the game again, whatever. These games didn't need to be made into movies to be legitimized. Just have the games exist for themselves. If people want the Uncharted experience, they have to go to the video game medium. Even if this film was good, I still wouldn't be all that interested. Like The Last of Us as another example, that's really well made, but I just don't have that much interest in watching this story that I've already seen. I've already played in a more thorough way. Anyway, Uncharted was inoffensive fluff that kills two hours. <laughs> At number 45, we have no no, I said almost. No love and grunder. Thor 4. You know this thing that Marvel are doing where they kind of interweave comedic tropes in with their movies? And initially we all thought, oh, that's really clever. That's really kind of creative. Like, oh yeah, you're like mixing in multiple genres to make it more spicy. But that's just no longer something to celebrate. It's no longer creative. It's just on brand. Like, I'm supposed to think that the Spider-Man films channel the same energy as the John Hughes films. And I'm like, maybe a little bit, but still just bland really just safe it's just the new trend like what classic film are we gonna lightly homage this time i'm bloody sick to death of it so this thor film is supposed to be like this wacky cosmic adventure i guess it's got an incy wincy bit of flair so hardcore marvel fans can say oh it's not bland this time the jokes however are awful and grating and just tired it's gone almost too far down the comedic route like it's almost like a pantomime at this point it's the stupidest and wackiest marvel film to date yet it inserts one of the most serious villains they've ever had and they got Christian Bale to play it. This is the movie that Marvel chose to use Christian Bale for. They spent their Christian Bale card on this pile of shit. To be fair, Christian Bale is good in this because he just goes off and does his own thing on everything he works on. He did manage to make it his own. It's quite strange to see that in this like disgracefully corporate movie. This strange bubble of authenticity in the midst of this ludicrously pandering monstrosity. The cinematography was overly flashy and just sensory overload. The CGI's trash. Honestly, it's almost as if Marvel are making a parody of themselves. You cannot come to the OG. You have to listen to us. That's it. Shut up! 44, Crimes of the Future. It's directed by David Cronenberg, who's a fantastic horror director from the 1980s. For reference, he directed The Fly, which is just an immensely amazing film. So Crimes of the Future is a post-apocalyptic psychological horror. It's a film that I think is supposed to inspire deep philosophical thought. The only problem is it's cheap, one note, and boring. The performances from Viggo Mortensen and Le Sadu are empty and self-important and always whispering as if everything they have to say is incredibly profound and philosophically rich. This is an art film you are watching here. It's truly sensational. Viggo Mortensen speaks in this pretentious, whispery voice the whole time. It just feels completely vapid and surface level. It's like, oh man, we're doing stuff. It's so edgy what we're doing. Oh, I can't believe it. Go back to fucking Middle Earth. Kristen Stewart is also in this. Her character is manic and over the top, but in a really ham-fisted way. It's way too on the nose that it's just annoying. Yeah, she was really bad in this. This film just wanks itself off for apparently being extremely avant-garde and radical. There were a few neat instances of impressive practical effects to depict body horror, but this ultimately has the profundity of a student film. It also has the look of a student film because it takes place in this ominous post-apocalyptic world that never gets fleshed out. It feels completely empty. And that's because all of the sets and filming locations are bare and or just look like shit. Like the location will be some random beach with a bunch of trash on it. The musical score was cool though. Forty-three, Amsterdam. Some people may like this one, which is totally fine. It's just not for me. Characters were just quirky for the sake of quirky. Christian Bale's performance was way too in your face and grating. The cast is distractingly stacked to the degree where it feels show-offy and pandering. It's also just overcrowded. Like Zoe Zaldana, Taylor Swift, Chris Rock, they really didn't need to be in this. The characters were gimmicky and didn't have any depth. I didn't care for anyone. The plot is intentionally convoluted and idiosyncratically delivered. It's not the first film to do this. There have been many films that have done this same thing that I've also thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah, sorry, everything about this movie was kind of irritating. And it's nothing to do with like how the director's like a fucking nonce or whatever. 
tax the rich. We find ourselves in a situation where we're accused of killing someone, which is not true. It's not At number 42, we have Fall. Not Fall Guys, Fall. I know some of you got excited then. Imagine a Fall Guys movie. Now that is a film that needs to be made. Fall is like a horror disaster thriller. It's cheap and awfully acted. It's cliche and stupid. But I can't lie, it's about like fear of heights and all that. It did give me the heebie-jeebies, so it did succeed in that area, and I can't deprive it of that. It's not awful, it just has this one gimmick, which is fear of heights, going up this big tower, oh no, what's gonna happen? It went by nice and quick, and I was never bored, because I was either made nervous by the franticness of the set pieces, or just laughing at the melodramatic acting. Every hour that passes, the weaker we get. If anyone called 911, they'd be here by now. Number 41, we have Transformers 6 Escape the Matrix, sequel to a popular blockbuster franchise. As I expected, superb special effects and some really cool action set pieces, but by God, the storytelling is disgracefully crass and manipulative. Its apparent philosophical overtones are vain, dumbfounded, and platitudinous. I can't be expected to have a thorough and immersive experience just based on impressive special effects alone. Okay, moving on to the next one. Oh wait, hang on, did I say Transformers? I, me I meant to say the other one. Which is it, the other one? Oh yeah, Avatar 2, that's the one. Oh well, I made a mistake, but all of the things I just said still apply. Just call it Avatar 2, what's this way of water pretentious shit, honestly? At number 40, we have Wendell and Wilde. Oh no, here come the hipster kids. Or whatever. I think this is directed by Henry Selick, who made Coraline, or at least Henry Selick is somewhat involved in this. So it has a cool and unique animation style, but the presentation of all of these story beats are just so obvious and dumb. All of the character development was rushed to the degree that all of the characters felt vacuous. This film was just really choppy, it just didn't take the time to make any of the characters three-dimensional. It's very conceptual and it just rushes along with things. It's like they had all of these quirky story beats, and they thought that just by mechanically having them play out one after the other, it would automatically make for a really good movie. Like, no, you have to account for other things like pacing, dialogue, editing. Just the general flow of scenes just feels really off in this. And not to mention it has this overt social political commentary that is so crudely intertwined with the rest of the film. But besides that, it was amazing. <gasps> At number 39, we have White Noise, or is it White Nose? People still don't know to this day. Oh, you hipster fucks, thanks. Oh. So Noah Bombach made this, and I loved Marriage Story, which is one of Noah Bombach's previous films. That film actually made me tear up a little bit, I think, maybe been so long. White noise though. Well this is apparently based off a famous novel, which makes sense, because there are some very unique and specific concepts explored in this film. The narrative has the potential to be interesting. There are certainly some very specific themes it's trying to explore. The problem lies in the way it's delivered. So the characters in this film don't behave like real people, which can work sometimes in other films. Since the characters don't behave like human beings, they aren't at all relatable or sympathetic. They come across as just mouthpieces for the ideas that the film wants to express or talk about. The characters just blather on about any given philosophical or psychological concept. And I'm not even being like derogatory there, like literally it's just rambling all the way through. I imagine this kind of thing working in a novel, but here it just doesn't translate. It is quite heavily copying the style of a Wes Anderson film when it comes to how the characters talk. And that's an aspect that within those Wes Anderson films, Films can sometimes work, but other times feel really monotonous. I really just wasn't interested in what this film wanted to discuss, and that's probably down to me not giving a shit about the characters. But also, it isn't really that much fun for you to just have your characters blur out the themes and ideas of the movie, when really you should be finding more creative ways to put said ideas across. Again, this wasn't awful, but it was monotonous and grating. Some people will no doubt get a lot out of this, but it just really wasn't for me. May the days be endless. Let the seasons drift. Do not advance the action according to a plan.
At number 38, we have Hustle. Hustle is the kind of film that we don't really get anymore because the landscape of cinema is utterly dominated by huge blockbusters. This here is just a quiet Friday night in movie. It's simple, laid back, inoffensive. We don't really get any big comedy releases these days, so this will be a breath of fresh air for some. It's not amazing, it's competently put together. It's your basic sports movie with a bit of Adam Sandler comedy mixed in there. The Adam Adam Sandler comedy in this film is no way near as obnoxious as it is in like Grown Ups or Jack and Jill. You can spot some trademark Sandler jokes here and there though. He does really like making jokes about people's appearance. Like, oh my god, have you seen the nose on that thing? <laughs> it's far more grounded as compared to most of his other comedies. It's almost like a no-nonsense dad movie. It's still all round and offensive. The only crass thing about it for me was just the obvious use of popular music. Music. That felt very pandering. It is a corporate comedy. I enjoyed it overall though. It's not reinventing the wheel or anything. It's fairly formulaic, but it did provide an experience that I've not gotten for a while within the film landscape. It's just a chilled out movie. It's not trying to be the next Infinity War. There's no multiverse stuff in it. It's got its own small scale story to tell and it just gets on with it. I love this game. I live this game. There's a thousand other guys waiting in the wings who are obsessed with this game. At number 37, we have Troll. Troll was a fun time. It's a Norwegian disaster movie released by Netflix. Essentially a little bit like a Norwegian Roland Emmerich film. Super cliche writing, really dumb, honestly fairly pandering. But I had fun with the concept. The monster troll was cool and the whole thing went by in a flash. We can place the knock. Number 38, The Batman. Directed by Matt Reeves. I reviewed this when it came out. It's well made with neat direction. I get why people like it. I get why people love it. I just don't think that the overall story and plot is that engaging. A lot of the moments where I was supposed to feel fear or tension really fell flat. It's like a sanitized version of the works of David Fincher. At number 35, we have Ennies Men. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's the film. Yeah, well, literally nothing happened in this. So Ennies Men is the latest film from director Mark Jenkin, who directed Bait in 2019, which was a film I really liked. Liked. In Bait, he created an atmosphere completely unique to itself. He shoots his films like old 70s horror thriller movies. A lot of authentic film grain. His style is very reminiscent of films like Straw Dogs and Don't Look Now. The worlds that his films take place in are extremely odd and uncanny almost Lynchian. He also intentionally has all his dialogue dubbed over in post, which works so well towards creating unease. There's a strange hollowness to everything you're seeing, a perpetual sense that something isn't right and you just can't put your finger on it. Bait's great, I would strongly recommend that. Any's men, however, well, it has the same style. All the director's trademarks are back. The plot is far more minimal and stripped back as compared to Bait. However, it's so much so that for me, there wasn't anything to sink my teeth into narratively. Bait at least had this very basic narrative surrounding the main character, but Ennis Men is just far too vague. It's very symbolic. There is a story to decipher here, as well as a few themes. It still possesses some very striking imagery, as well as some unsettling and innovative editing choices. But it just offers up nothing to help you get invested in the movie strongly enough for you to start engaging with all of the subtext. Yeah, sadly that was a disappointing one. At number 34, we have Prey. Prey is a pseudo sequel slash prequel to Predator. It's like linked to all of that. It takes the Predator creature and places it within a different historical setting, this time in primitive Native American times. So it's essentially all about how a Native American tribe would have dealt with the monster. This is an engaging enough creature feature. There were a lot of fairly cool moments. However, there were way too many times where you could quite plainly see obvious uses of CG. CGI. It really didn't do a good job at hiding the unpolished CGI. Not a lot of the special effects in this film looked convincing. The acting and dialogue was on a B-movie level. Unfortunately, the characters were speaking in a very modern manner and that was really distracting. 
They were saying shit like, oh, get back in the kitchen to a woman, essentially. The whole cast also looked way too clean and pretty, given the setting. The main character in particular, you could tell, was just an actress pretending to be a Native American rather than the real thing. It's not very immersive, there wasn't that much attention to detail when it came to authentically capturing the time period. Besides all of those fairly crucial flaws, I did enjoy myself. 33, we have Elvis. Elvis was an interesting one. So I was expecting an another safe, inoffensive, family-friendly biopic about this famous rock star. And thankfully, that's not really what this movie is. This movie might have some of the most experimental editing of last year. It's not good editing though. It's completely jarring and incoherent, but it at least sets it apart from the other generic biopics. It's trying something different at least. It's an extremely, extremely fast paced film that's very stylistic. My major problem with it, however, was it plays more like an extended music video-esque montage of a man's life and never really stops to breathe or flesh out any aspects of his character. It was honestly giving me a seizure. I was literally just sat there watching it like, fucking hell, this is a film about Elvis. Why don't you slow the fuck down? It's certainly not generic, so there's at least that. Austin Butler did a fantastic job at depicting Elvis, and everyone I've spoken to who kind of grew up during Elvis's reign said that he was spot on. Tom Hanks, on the other hand, was extremely cartoonish. This might be like the worst Tom Hanks performance I've ever seen. It was way too silly for me. I couldn't take him seriously at all. His voice was grating. It was like a Sacha Baron Cohen character. At numero 32, we have Deadstream. Deadstream is a found footage horror movie about a content creator slash live streamer who live streams himself as he spends 24 hours in this supposed haunted house. It's a very topical and interesting watch. It's essentially poking fun at the moronic nature of internet celebrities. This character is essentially a Logan Paul type where it's all about creating the most sensational content, covering topics in the least tasteful ways. For me, the best part about this movie was how accurately it depicted influencer culture. It wasn't perfect and not everything was spot on, on, but you could tell that the people who made this movie knew what they were doing. In particular, they did a great job at recreating the style of video that these kind of influencers make, down to the editing choices and the moments of comedic levity, all of the tired tropes of pandering YouTube content, how content creators incorporate memes into their videos, all of that just felt very authentic. It's a very cheap movie, but it's not really pretending to be anything else. The lead is good, but most of the rest rest of the acting is quite noticeably bad, and there's only so much weak acting that you can tolerate before you just start becoming unimmersed. I did like some of the practical and gore effects, even though you could tell that they were blatantly fake. The comedic nature of the film probably softened the blow in that area. Sometimes you weren't supposed to be frightened, but more so amused, and unrealistic looking practical effects can still work for that. Overall, this wasn't perfect, but it was a cool little movie. Uh, I would recommend it, so yeah, go watch it if you want. I'm not going to force you to, but you can if you want to, baby. I don't want to be remembered as a douchebag. Somebody help me! Oh no, not this one. Number 31, men. Oh, that dreaded word. I hate men. I hate myself for being part of this oppressive patriarchy. Down with everything. Down with the patriarchy. Bad patriarchy. You've been a bad, you've been a bad patriarchy. Patriarchy's been a bad boy. Men is another one of those films. I get why people like it. I get the intrigue. I really wanted to like it myself, but it just feels so thematically simplistic. You know the exact themes that the film is driving at from very early on, and it doesn't really go on to explore said themes in any interesting ways. It doesn't develop or further them. You can kind of grasp the entire point of the movie just from the trailer. Rory Kinnear was way too cartoonish for me. Being of British descent, I could spot the inauthenticity and in all of the British archetypes he was portraying. It just all felt surface level. There is some mad imagery in here, like some truly shocking and gruesome imagery, but it's all in service of fairly simplistic themes again. At number 30, we have The Fablemans. The Fablemans is Steven Spielberg's latest work, loosely based off of his early life as a kid and then later a teen. Now this, for the most part, is a competently made crowd
crowd pleaser that the whole family will enjoy. It will unite everyone together around the living room. It may be fairly formulaic for some. It definitely fits the bill of an Oscar bait movie. I still liked it, however. The acting is decent. It's not doing anything revolutionary. It's a film in part about filmmaking. I even thought it had some interesting things to say about the cinematic art form, the power of movie making, how you can use it to accentuate the truths that you find in reality. Also just watching a young man create made for some very captivating scenes. It's gorgeously shot with Spielberg's trademark larger than life lighting. The lighting is dreamy and fantastical. Spielberg has that down to a fine art. It's not an amazing film but it's decent and I had fun with it. Again it is in part formulaic. I wasn't utterly glued to the screen the whole time. I've seen a lot of these dramatic tropes done time and time again but there's enough in here to make it stand out as more than just a factory movie. 29 gives us 3,000 years of longing. This is a weird one. A very weird one. This is the kind of movie that that weird girl who's obsessed with books would take you to see. I would absolutely love it. I sought this out because it's directed by George Miller, who directed Mad Max Fury Road, as well as other things. I've literally not heard anyone else talk about this movie. It sort of went under the radar, but it is good. It almost plays like an anthology, as it follows the life of a genie throughout different historical settings. It's strange, it's quirky, there hasn't been anything else quite like it this year. It's its own thing. I probably won't ever watch it again, but it's just a goofy little film. Therefore, no one gave it the time of day. Films like these that are just not spectacular, but not awful, not bland, kind of special. There's no place for these kind of movies anymore in Hollywood. 28. The Menu. The Menu is a film that was written by a bunch of Redditors. I like the things that it has to say about being an artist, losing your way, things like obsession over passion, and food is a very good subcategory to explore these ideas through. I often make a lot of analogies to cooking when talking about movies. If you fuck up a movie, you just give the audience a bad time, but if you fuck up a dish, you could potentially kill someone. So a lot more is on the line in that art form. The whole cheeseburger thing at the end and what all that represented, really love that. My biggest gripe with the film was just with how cartoonish all the characters were. I know it is a satire so maybe that's appropriate but I just hate one dimensional archetypes in films. Characters that feel like straw men slash straw women. It didn't bother me as much as other films have that have this same kind of problem but it was a little bit like uh, a little bit annoying. Not all the dialogue was all that subtle. It is certainly an interesting movie however and I I was gripped the whole time. I was definitely never bored. 27. Glass Onion, a Knives Out Mystery. What a shit title. Let's just call it Glass Onion. More eat the rich stuff. There's a lot of films this year that are going after the rich. A Glass Onion was a fun time. Above all else, I was just looking for a well-written and surprising plot with unique direction. I thought Knives Out was a solid movie. These films are homaging the styles of the old-timey Agatha Christie whodunits and they do that very well. I don't think Glass Onion is anywhere near as good as Knives Out. The mystery wasn't as intriguing for me this time round and I can't really see myself ever watching this again. I did happen to watch it twice just because I watched it with someone else and it wasn't that good on rewatch. Daniel Craig was once again magnetic to watch. I really like seeing him having fun with a role, unlike the stale and stagnant Bond films that he just grew so tired of. I hope Craig continues to do stuff like this. Kate Hudson was against type and larger than life. She was fun, just playing playing an utter moron. There is a lot of humour in this, which is fairly middling, fairly like normy kind of stuff. That might have bothered me a lot more if there wasn't this fun mystery to keep me engaged. The lead actress was unfortunately quite weak, a lot of unconvincing and flat line deliveries. That's a goddamn lie! You could see an actor trying to act instead of a character. Also, this film's pretty woke. You know what, unironically, it is pretty woke. So, you know, it's going after Elon Musk and it's a little bit on the nose. There's a line that Daniel Craig says to Kate Hudson's character where it's like, you know, it's a dangerous thing to mistake speaking without thought for speaking the truth. And you can tell that Ryan Johnson was like, this is my line. Ryan Johnson's going to be like, oh god, that is a really topical line. People are going to absolutely love this. Because you can like apply it to modern times and all of the things that like Trump says. Twitter would have ate that shit up. This film isn't nearly as clever as it probably thinks it is, but it's captivating and well written enough. And there you have it. At 26 we have RRR. Finally, onto some real Kino.
I did try and watch this film in its native tongue so I wouldn't have to listen to obviously dubbed lines of dialogue, but I'm pretty sure that there is no version of this that isn't obviously dubbed over. I did switch through a couple of languages and the audio quality was the exact same. RRR is the first Bollywood film I've ever seen and it seems like a good one to start with. This film is an all-encompassing historical epic, kind of like Ben-Hur. It's got action, drama, romance, comedy, tragedy, everything. It's massive, bombastic, and sprawling. It feels monumental. Like, this is what you go to the cinema for. It's a period piece set during the British colonial occupation of India. I'm not sure as to what precise year. They essentially depict the British military as the Empire from Star Wars, which is really cool. You fucks are evil. There's a general played by the guy from Rome, who is this scenery-chewing, moustache-twirling villain. From what I know about Bollywood movies, they seem to have a far more unapologetic approach towards depicting drama. Their films are extremely theatrical and over the top. Every technical aspect of filmmaking is cranked up to 10 to maximise the dramatic effect of every scene. The sound effects, the editing, the musical score, there's no subtlety. It's all completely in your face. As a result, their films feel extremely melodramatic, but in the most endearing ways. You must have seen examples of how they edit their soap operas. To people outside of the culture, it is outrageously memeable. I'm honestly not sure how genuine the storytelling is, how blatantly emotionally manipulative it's being. I mean, it is utterly sensational. It's an interesting cultural contrast, however, and I'm glad I watched it. It's also three fucking hours long. The pacing is ridiculous. This is like three movies rolled into one. I remember I got to a certain point which structurally resembled the third act climax, and then I paused to see how much time was left, and there was like another hour and 40 minutes remaining. It has like three third acts. Luckily though, the action set pieces are really imaginative and visually stimulating to watch, as well as being clearly put across and visually communicated. It's not just a bunch of visual drivel. You can quite clearly see every movement made by the action stars. Honestly, the combat scenes play almost like dance routines, which adds its own sense of theatricality. As mentioned before, it's all dubbed over, so I watch the English dub. It sounds like shit, it's ridiculous, but I do think that might be the norm in Bollywood. I don't think that's a good excuse, but I just think that's like what they're used to. That's standard practice. The cinematography is pretty corporate and flat to be fair. Most of it's shot like a modern advertisement. There's nothing in the cinematography that's indicative of the time period, but it does also heavily centre around a bromance, which again is unapologetically presented to the audience. They weren't at all afraid of having their characters being perceived perceived as gay. It's really wholesome to see, they're just really good friends, but having said that, they do make it abundantly clear that each of them are attracted to women as they do both have their own love interests, but still it was the kind of bromance we don't really see anymore. Just two fucking friends swinging dicks around, hanging out. There was a Bollywood dance at the end which was joyous and vibrant, I really like that. Whatever else you can say about this film, it certainly has a staggering amount of energy, and it's better than Avatar 2. At number 25, we have Triangle of Sadness. This was a film festival, darling. It won the Palm Door at Cannes. <gasps> it's directed by Robert Osland, who also directed The Square back in 2017, which also won the Palm Door. So this Ruben guy is a two-time Golden Palm winner, so good for him. Ruben Osland definitely has his own directorial style, and I don't just mean that in a technical sense, but also in a narrative and thematic sense. The Square was a very intriguing film. I don't know what it was about, but it was intriguing. It has a chaotic structure. It's far from perfect, but I get the appeal. Triangle of Sadness, on the other hand, was far more scatterbrained. So it's yet another juicy allegorical film about class. This film is at its best when it's subtly communicating its themes about class through the visuals and or the simple unfolding of events. That's the preferred way to present ideas in film, in my opinion. You can use dialogue to get points across in movies, but it should be used sparingly and almost as a last resort, I think. My favourite parts about this film were when it was illustrating its points by just 
showing the characters being themselves. Their simple presence and behaviour tells a story. Everything in the island segment of the film fell into this category. You were just observing what was happening and piecing together what it was all about for yourself. The statements about class that it was making, however, ranged from genuinely intriguing to a little bit simplistic. Again, some of this film is interesting, but some of it isn't. Towards the middle of this film was when it really started to sag or just get like tedious. There was a scene where an American communist and a Russian capitalist were having an argument and you can tell like what happens there. I think you can just picture how that turns out. It's not very subtle. This film just started listing off some of the ideas it wanted to get off its chest through obvious dialogue. I don't mind ending a film completely confused and then later gradually figuring it out. All the rich people vomiting and shitting themselves. I'm not quite sure what that was all about. If anyone in the comment section wants to enlighten me, feel free. I just don't know what that was about. Yeah. And me just admitting that is going to make this whole take of mine irrelevant, so whatever. This film isn't a masterpiece, but it does contain a lot of solid and subtle storytelling. It's just all over the place. I don't want to hear anybody saying no. It's always yes sir, yes ma'am. At 24, we have Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. How dare you put a Marvel film above a Palm Door winner, Bacho. You really have really done it now. Multiverse of Madness, or MOM to be short, Mom, is also a film that is far from perfect, but it has a few redeeming features which make it a little bit more special in my head. As a multiverse film, it's quite unimaginative and watered down. The plot is quite underwhelming in typical Marvel film fashion. As a Sam Raimi directed Marvel film, it does not live up to its full creative potential by any stretch of the imagination. Guardians 2, for instance, that is a great movie that lives up to its full idiosyncratic potential. This film does not. However, it possesses just enough of Raimi's creative trademarks to pass as a decent film. To stand out a little bit more, Wanda's mustache twirling villainous arc, how she's depicted as this creepy, unstoppable force, the energetic camera that feels as though it has a mind of its own, the goofy editing choices, Doctor Strange possessing the body of a corpse, that was awesome. The character of Doctor Strange himself is fairly generic though. The way Wanda kind of unceremoniously dies at the end felt like a nothing burger. It didn't shake up the MCU like it suggested it would. Marvel are just pussyfooting around this multiverse concept at the moment. Now we're on to number 23, which is Apollo 10 and a half, A Space Age Childhood. This is an adult animated movie set in the 70s, directed by Richard Linklater, who is most known for the Before trilogy and Boyhood. This is a personal project that was just unceremoniously dumped on Netflix. It uses the animation technique that I believe is known as rotoscoping, where they've used real actors and environments and then created an animation mask over it. It's a very visually distinct form of animation. I haven't seen that many films that have used this technique, but I liked what I saw here. It's very nice to look at. It's a fanciful coming-of-age story about a young boy who is selected for a top-secret Apollo mission, and he gets to go to space, and it all coincides with Apollo 11, but it's a top-secret one that happened just before Apollo 11. It's all a silly fabrication, but it's in service of showcasing what life was like growing up in that era of America. It's like a nice time capsule movie. It's vibrant and fun, maybe not for everyone, but I'd recommend it still, so go fucking watch it. Mom, is that one a hippie? Yeah, yeah, that's a hippie. How about that one? No, his hair's not long enough. But he's wearing bell bottoms. Okay, that's a hippie. At number 22, we have All Quiet on the Western Front. Oh yeah, baby, a war film, a nice masculine war film to sink my teeth into. All Quiet on the Western Front is a poignant film set during World War One. It shows the war from the perspective of the young German soldiers, which is a unique angle for a war movie. At this time, I think war films have been done to death. Everyone has been trying to recreate Saving Private Ryan ever since that came out. Most of these films all have the exact same platitudinous message of war 
war bad. Oh, look how bad it is because they're all the boys are so young. Oh, they're too young to die. Somehow, however, despite how stale this genre has become, All Quiet on the Western Front managed to showcase the horrors of war in an authentic and fresh way. I liked how it emphasised the disposability of German lives, starting with that opening scene where they were scavenging uniforms off of the dead soldiers only for them to be repurposed for new recruits. Visual, expressive, subtle. That one particular horrific scene involving artillery units, I believe that's what they're called. I haven't seen a war film tackle that aspect before. The daunting technological mechanisms that would have been completely alien to these ordinary men. They had no idea what they were up against. It's honestly horrifying. The way that it ended perfectly cemented these themes of the futility of war. I greatly prefer this to films like 1917, for instance, which I thought was just really unoriginal. This is a solid and intellectually stimulating war film. Wieder mehr als 40.000 Tote allein in den letzten Wochen. Es ist vorbei. Number 21, we have Hellraiser. Hellraiser is a reboot of the 1987 film of the same name. Of the entire Hellraiser franchise, I've only seen this new one as well as the original. I know there's a lot of them because they absolutely milked these kind of franchises back in the 80s. It's a horror franchise that I'm fairly new to, but one that I find quite intriguing and different. I enjoyed the original and this remake is far from just a mediocre cash grab. For one, it has very strong characters to follow. It begins with an interesting introduction to our main character as it explores her relationship with her brother. In that opening, it manages to establish these characters as nicely three-dimensional people. They're actually compelling. It's very important in horror movies for there to be really good characters at the core. That way you're all the more invested and frightened when bad stuff starts to befall them. I suppose you could categorise the Hellraiser franchise within the torture porn subgenre. It does have its own very unique lore and this new film builds upon that lore in very faithful and creative ways. There are a lot of fairly unsettling concepts explored in this film. It's genuinely squeamish and disturbing. You definitely wouldn't want to suffer the same fates as the victims in this film. A lot of instances where you're like, bloody hell, they didn't deserve that. I got really freaked out by some of the scenes in this film, which does indicate that it succeeds as a horror. For horror fans, this is a must-see. I don't know if I like it as much as the first one. The original stands out a little more in my head. But this is still very good. What is it you pray for? At number 20, we have Tar. Tarzan? Nah, just Tar. Tarzan would be way more interesting, wouldn't it? Tar is one of the films that has been in the running for this year's Oscars. It's nominated for Best Picture. Kate Blanchett is nominated for Best Leading Actress. Kate Blanchett definitely deserves that nomination. She is genuinely sensational. She has completely ingratiated herself into this character. It's not just a show off performance. It's inspiringly good acting. If I was like an aspiring actor watching this, I'd be like, oh my god, this is just what it's all about. Now, despite what you may have expected from like one of those films that's in the running for the Oscars, Tar is a good film. It's not wishy-washy, it's not safe and bland, it's distinctly miserable and dreary. It has an artist's mark. The cinematography is beautifully depressing with amazing uses of monochromatic colouring. The composition is some of the best I've seen all year. This film has its own atmosphere, its own world, and for that I was pleasantly surprised. It also functions as a thought-provoking character study about the talented artist archetype, cancel culture, toxic relationships. It contains all of the ingredients of a masterpiece and then, unfortunately, more some. This film is too long. It takes up more time than it needs to get its point across and after a while it does become a chore to finish. It has a very slow pace which I think is completely appropriate given what the film is but since the film overstays its welcome that slow pace becomes less and less endearing as it goes on. I liked how it ended and the poignancy of the final shot, but this may be a film that I re-watch lightly. However, there is a good possibility that watching this within the comfort of my own home rather than the cinema will prove to be a better way to consume this film's massive length. I'm worried. She's starting to disappear into herself. 
Number 19, Turning Red. Turning Red is a Pixar film that came out very early on in 2022. Between this, Soul and Coco, I'd say that Pixar is still making good movies. Turning Red has a unique animation style from other Pixar projects, which I really appreciated. Far more cartoonish and anime inspired. It was very expressive and refreshing to see. I really enjoyed this film. There wasn't anything obnoxious or pandering about it. I was okay with the fact that it was set during 2002 and didn't once mention the September 11th attacks. I let that slide. Pixar films often tell compelling archetypal stories and they're always a little bit more daring and challenging as compared to other kids' movies. I found this film to be very bold in how it tackled its subject matter, so essentially an allegory for getting your period. A good lesson for young girls. It didn't shy away from these themes or water them down. It's very challenging for a modern kids' film. It gets fairly explicit and poignant the main monster's design has the colour scheme of a used tampon, which I think was especially ballsy. And I'm not even joking. It's also about taming the monster within you, acknowledging your aggressive and destructive side, the importance of not suppressing those emotions. So like all good Pixar films, it expressed ideas in ways that could be compelling to both kids and adults. Good Pixar film, embrace the shadow, brothers and sisters in this case. At number 18 we have Megan. This might be a bit of a wild card, but I had a blast with this film. Megan is a horror creature feature type movie about a life-sized robot girl who is supposed to act as a friend and or guardian to a young girl. It's supposed to look after a child and be its friend. It starts off really nice, but then something goes wrong and maybe it turns evil. Ooh, you know, it's one of those films. It's taking a lot of inspiration from Child's Play, which is also a very fun, goofy movie. It's also kind of scary. James Wan was involved as a producer on this, and it feels similar to his style of horror. He directed a lot of the Saw films, as well as The Conjuring and Malignant. I'll preface, he didn't direct Megan, he just produced it. Megan is a very tropey horror movie, but it wears its goofiness on its sleeves. It's not pretending to be this ultra-serious film, like Smile, but there's no tacky self-referential humour either. It presents itself so unapologetically that it functions as a parody of itself, and there's an added entertainment value just in that. It's a lot of fun. I was smirking a lot all the way through this film. It's very amusing. I enjoyed the stupid dialogue and the over-the-top characters. The main character's boss has to be in on the joke. That was just ridiculous. Every word out of his mouth was hilariously cliche and over-the-top. Really, this plays like a kick-ass action horror movie about this robot girl. It's more entertaining and thrilling than it is scary. There are some genuinely awesome action scenes in this. Almost like Terminator-esque. It definitely feels like a fun B-movie. I like the whole gimmick of the film's creature. It was a cool concept and they made a fun movie out of it. It was awesome. It was a good movie, I recommend. Experts say- Megan, turn off. I thought we were having a conversation. Now we're on to 17, and that film is X. X is another horror film. This one was produced by the amazing Supreme A24 production company. X is homaging old 70s B-movie slashers. It's centered around this young group of filmmakers in the late 70s who head to this ranch to film an adult movie. So it's in part a film about filmmaking again. Also makes for a nice spin on the slasher format. It's interesting seeing the behind the scenes of making an adult film in that era. It hints at themes of female subjugation, namely the commodification of the female body. That's the subtext of the film at least, and another angle that makes this film more stand out. A lot of good horror movies benefit from this, but it has a really good sense of setup and payoff. Plot devices don't just come out of nowhere. Everything is nicely established. It's well shot, well acted. And right before the killing begins, there's this really good scene where all of the characters are talking and having this interesting discussion about the adult film industry. And that just did its job to add to the film as well. Just little bits of subtext that make the film more interesting. It's not amazing, or extraordinary, as it's, it's very simple. It's just a slasher film, mate, but it does a good job of making the most of its simplistic format. I really enjoyed it. It was a fun time. You don't want to leave, do you? People's eyes are going to pop out of their damn skulls when they see this. 
number 16, The Northman. Eep. The Northman is another 2022 film that I made a review of when it came out, so go and watch that now, you bastards. While it wasn't utterly enticing all the way through, it still serves as a good story about the fruitlessness of revenge. It's easily Robert Eggers' weakest film, but at least he wanted to make something different. I can't say that I found the main character that interesting, but luckily the visceral journey that he went on made for a stimulating time. The things he goes through and the stuff that happens to him, that's the interesting part for me. I like this film's take on Viking culture, in particular they emphasised how animalistic they were. The Vikings in this film heavily manifest traits that they share most in common with beastly predators like wolves, so that was pretty Sigma. I want to kill you, feel it. Number 15, Skinnamarink. Skinnamarink is another film where nothing happens. And I'm not even joking, literally nothing happens but it's still really good. Chances are you haven't seen a film quite like this, at least within the mainstream circuit. This movie is extremely vague as to what it's about, and I don't really want to say that much about it. I don't know the technicals, but it's shot in a way to maximise the amount of visual noise captured by the camera. The frame is so cluttered with grain that you begin to see images in the vagueness. I'm pretty sure it's recreating that universal experience of when you're lying awake at night in the dark, and because there is so little light that your eyes can detect you can only see black fuzz and in that black vagueness you start to see things that aren't there and these strange images and you really freak yourself out it's like this shapeless void that feels alive you don't know what's looking back at you i really like how this film incorporated that it's very clever all the way through it's shot with these unconventional unflattering camera angles they look as if the camera has just been dropped on the floor and forgotten about and you can only make out a few individual objects at a time because everything is obscured it makes everything feel mysterious and uninviting, you're never quite able to breach into this world, your vision is so limited. You also never see a single human face throughout the whole film. At most you see the back of people's heads but you have no familiar face to latch onto. The audio to this film is intentionally tinny and rough, it makes everything sound all the more alien and distorted. Honestly some of the sounds in this film make enough of a horror experience on their own, it's otherworldly and ghoulish. Even the simple lines of dialogue from the children in the film are bone chilling because they're so intrusive. They're like right up against the mic it feels, like right up against your ear. It's like some horrible twisted ASMR. I know I wasn't going to say much, so maybe light spoilers, but there are entities in this film that have a way of manipulating reality in a uniquely unsettling way. They seem to just be able to remove things from reality, like small objects, doors, chairs, body parts. They can change the entire layouts of rooms. You don't know anything. You just know that you're in this house with these kids who can't find the parents, and some kind of supernatural entity is fucking with them. It's extremely extremely vague and minimalistic. Somehow, what little it was showing was enough for me to not only remain interested with the film, but actually glued to the screen because I had no idea what I was up against, so to speak. I watched this at around 3 in the morning because my sleeping pattern's absolutely fucked, and that helped to get me in the mood. But watching this film put me in a state of constant agitation. Maybe not everyone will like this, but I think that everyone should at least give it a go and see what happens. <laughs> Number 14, Pinocchio. There's been a lot of new Pinocchio films recently, but the one I'm addressing now is the one that's directed by Guillermo del Toro. This Pinocchio film is actually good because it's not just a pointless reimagining. Guillermo del Toro and co clearly had an inspired vision for this new rendition of this classic story. It certainly is the most grittiest and mature take I've seen on the Pinocchio story. This is more so targeted at adult audiences. It takes place within a world that more closely closely resembles our own. It's very explicitly set in Italy during World War II, which is another thing that is heavily incorporated into the story. Like, Pinocchio literally joins the fascist Italian military. It's appropriately done, it all serves his character arc of becoming an honourable and responsible boy. Fascist dictatorships are a good way to showcase the dangers of becoming fixated on a narrow-minded ideology. It was an interesting lesson to see the character learn. The iconic character of Mussolini also makes an appearance in 
than this, voiced by Tom Kenny, the voice of SpongeBob. The stop motion animation is beautiful. Maybe the art style is the best part about this film. I particularly enjoyed this film's unique take on the afterlife and how all that looked, it's gorgeous. It was a complete contrast to the look of the rest of the film. It felt ethereal and dreamlike. The cast of voice actors is varied and colorful. David Bradley was fantastic as Geppetto, Christoph Waltz as the Fox. And in some areas it actually improves upon the original film because that original film had a story that felt pretty random and structureless. For instance, when the whale showed up, that was just completely out of left field, like, okay, and now a whale eats his dad and he has to go save him. And you're like, what the fuck? Where did that come from? In this, they like properly establish how Geppetto gets himself in that situation. And it's all beautifully set up and it flows naturally. This is a truly great retelling of the classic story and probably the best Pinocchio film that I've seen. Granted, it's only two that I've seen now. I'm not watching all the other shite ones that came out last year. I'd still say children should watch this. I think they'd get a lot out of it. Again, it's mature and challenging as it goes to some fairly dark places. The wooden boy with the borrowed soul. While you may have eternal life, your loved ones, they do not. Numero 13, Barbarian. Barbarian is a subversive horror comedy that actually manages to be entertaining and fresh. There are three distinct segments to this film. I think my favorite was the first segment. It was extremely slow, but always tense. It took its time getting to the punch, which I really appreciated. And for a good 35 minutes, I was utterly hooked. The performers in that scene played it in a very relatable and naturalistic way. The second act throws you off and takes a huge turn, but gradually aligns itself back with the central plot. I also really enjoyed the second act. Justin Long was awesome. He played a really funny asshole whom you almost felt sorry for to an extent. I wanted Justin Long to have a redemption arc, which almost happened, but he just was too much of a doofus. He did get his comeuppance, which I appreciated, showcased in a really disgusting manner. The third act, for the most part, kept the quality consistent. Obviously, when the mystery is completely gone, it's inevitably going to be less interesting. My only gripe with this section of the film was the homeless character. He was obviously serving as an homage to a particular horror movie archetype. The rough homeless man who you think is evil but then turns out to be good. He supplies the exposition on the monster. Even though he was homaging a B-movie, I still thought his performance was distractingly quite bad. Furthermore, I also liked how it utilised the real-life locations of all of those abandoned Detroit suburbs. It's a literal ghost town and I think that acts as a very good setting for a horror. Again, like with X, there's a lot of subtext to this film. I'm not going to go into any of it now, but it's well interwoven with the story. Expressed very subtly and never directly said to the audience. Like, hey, this is what the film's really about. Overall, this film was an absolute blast and I'm looking forward to watching it again someday with like a few friends maybe, see what they think of it. This is perfectly natural. <laughs> Number 12, Bardo, a false chronicle of a handful of truths. The most pretentious film of the year. This is Alejandro Gonzalez Inarritu's latest film. He was the director behind Birdman and The Revenant. Bardo is far less accessible than those two films. This film appears to be very autobiographical for Alejandro. It's very introspective and perhaps indulgent. It's essentially about this documentary filmmaker slash journalist having this self-analytical episode. We take a non-linear, almost flow of conscious-esque look back at his whole life. Life. The character is very self-critical about himself as well as his work. In many ways, this is Alejandro having a conversation with himself, which depending on the intellectual profundity of the artist doing this, can either be actually interesting or completely tedious and dull. And luckily, I believe that this artist fits the former description. The psychological, philosophical, sociological concepts it discussed were stimulating to sit through. The production value was vast and included some eye-catching set pieces. There's going to be many people who strongly dislike this for being self-indulgent, which again, in many ways it is, but I found that almost every scene had something of value to express and or explore. I think it will appeal to people who are involved with any form of artistic or creative pursuit, as the internal monologues put forth by this movie are ones that I believe to be very common for creative types to have with themselves. I'm not trying to say I'm a 
like a big creative guy because I liked it. I just liked it for my own reasons. I'm not trying to like big myself up like, oh, only creative people or whatever. Only artistic people will uh, find substance in this. No, not at all. It's fine if this isn't your thing, but I got a fair amount out of it. Bardo, more like Bordeaux. <laughs> Number 11, bodies, bodies, bodies. Wow, this is high. Oh, who gives a shit? It's just a wacky rating done for fun, isn't it? Stop taking this shit so seriously, everyone. Bodies, Bodies, Bodies is a horror comedy that takes on the structure of a slasher movie that follows a bunch of Gen Zers. The whole premise is, let's put this group of Gen Zers in this slasher horror environment and see what happens. This may sound gimmicky, which it very well could have been, but thankfully this film manages to pull it off in a way that doesn't feel one-dimensional or pandering. It's very topical, but not in any exploitative ways. It just authentically captures how this generation behaves and then lets the audience laugh at them. I usually find it quite off-putting when a film tries to be all hip and down with the kids, including all of these buzzwords and such, but this film didn't irritate me in the slightest. It all worked fine. People have said that they disliked this movie because they found the characters to be cringy and annoying. Now, technically they are correct, but this film is 100% aware of how idiotic it's characters are. It's definitely leaning towards being a satire. That being said, these characters still aren't overly cartoonish where they just feel like empty stereotypes. I still saw them as fully fledged human beings. Me personally didn't find any of the characters irritating, it's just what a group of dumb teens looks like. Pete Davidson is in this and he was good. He was a likeable asshole for me. The main character who was played by the girl from Borat 2 really distinct on-screen presence. She was a really relatable character to center the whole film around. She was like, what the fuck is going on? What, what the fuck's wrong with these people? There's also a lesbian couple in this film, and as it's produced by A24, they depict that relationship very tastefully. It's so easily done when you just don't treat these things like fucking carnival attractions. It's unapologetic as well, it ain't like fucking Buzz Lightyear. This film opens with a close-up of the two women having a tongue-in session. This film was a lot of fun, and offered an original spin on the slasher format. I know I've already said that about a couple of films on this list, but it just so happens to be the case that horror films were just doing that last year. A lot of horror films in 2022 tackled the slasher format and offered their own unique twist on it. And it was very wholesome. You pushed her, liar! You just want to beat me. At number 10, we have Top Gun Maverick. Top fucking gun, eh? This movie was incredible. This might be the most generous placement on this list, but on an action level, this film excels. The attention to detail that Tom Cruise and co. maintained whilst filming these action set pieces is truly overwhelming. Movies are supposed to be hard to make, and this constantly made you go, good lord, how did they capture this on film? That is the magic of cinema, it should completely completely stun you. So the action is top notch, it's well shot, well envisioned, well orchestrated. It's not just a bunch of fast paced nonsense, it's sophisticated and detailed. Shooting things the hard way always pays off. Doing it for real, doing it authentically always rings true for the viewer, even if they're consciously aware of it or not. Effort, passion and precision within filmmaking always translates to something truly special. I respect Tom Cruise for his dedication towards capturing these set pieces authentically. Seeing as though the action is this film's strongest asset, it smartly orients itself in such a way where the action is at the forefront. That's where most of the emphasis is put on. It's a simple plot. They have this one insanely difficult mission that this new group of pilots need to train for. And the whole film is just about getting them ready for that. It's not a bombardment of one overly extravagant set piece after the other. It's this one mission. It feels very focused in that way. All this time that the film puts into setting up this one mission makes the final sequence all the more satisfying. Tonally, this film is incredibly cliche and cheesy, but similarly to many it almost acts as a tongue-in-cheek parody of itself. It's not taking itself too seriously, but at the same time, it's not undercutting the dramatic scenes with crude, postmodern humour. There are emotional beats that are played completely straight, but I still think that the film is in on the joke and smirking along with the audience. I didn't mind the silly, cliche archetypes in this, it was all just part of the fun. It's ridiculous and corny, but still kick-ass at the same time. I thought it was really 
cool when Hangman came in to save the day after being the stereotypical douchebag character for the whole film. It's the first film in a while to make a shit ton of money that I'm actually happy for. I'm glad this was so successful, it's a true epic. We needed some goddamn optimism, man. You can skip the first film if you haven't seen it already and just go straight to this new one. It's way better than the first. Go see it now if you haven't already. Number nine, we have Pearl. So Pearl is actually a prequel film to X, which we were just talking about before. Apparently director Ty West and actress Maya Goth got the idea for this prequel story for the Pearl character whilst they were on location filming X. So the old grandma from X, this is her prequel origin story, Pearl. It just seems like such a wholesome way to come up with an idea, just something that spawned completely spontaneously whilst being creative from nothing other than an authentic desire to tell a story. I mean, that's literally the best circumstance from which a prequel movie could have been envisioned from. While X was a fun film that I enjoyed, Pearl cranks things up a notch. This is a full-on character study. At first, I did find Maya Goth's performance to be a little gimmicky and unconvincing. I wasn't sure if I was going to like this film, but as it went on and we looked further into her character, I was violently proven wrong. In many ways, it's similar to X since it's a stripped back and simple story. Plot-wise, very little happens, but it's what it does with its simple structure that makes it stand out. It does a lot with a little as it focuses in on the psychology of this Pearl character. I do love small-scale films with very short runtimes that still manage to tell a provocative and memorable story. It just proves how resourceful you can be as a creative storyteller. Near the end, there's an extended monologue by Maya Goth's character where the camera stays locked on her for a good five minutes. And for all that time, she completely grips you. She is sensational there. All the while, you see nothing but a fully realised character. It's powerful stuff. That extended monologue greatly improved the movie for me. It kind of made it. Yeah, Pearl was Kino. <laughs> Number eight, we have The Whale. Oi, biggin. The Whale is Darren Aronofsky's latest picture. Last time you heard from this guy, he gave us the film Mother, explanation mark, which was a very divisive film. The Whale is probably a lot more accessible for people. For those of you who don't know, Darren Aronofsky made Requiem for a Dream and Black Swan. Black Swan might be one of my favorite films of all time, but it has been a minute since I last saw it. But think Whiplash for girls. Oh wait, I'm not allowed to like Darren Aronofsky anymore because he stole everything he is from Satoshi Kon. Oh, I forgot. Black Swan is just a rip-off of Perfect Blue. Well good, Black Swan I can buy for 15 quid on a Blu-ray. Perfect Blue, there's only like 10 of them in existence in the whole world, and they cost like 160 quid each, so fuck it. The Whale has the basic outline of an Oscar bait film, but fret not, the presentation is wholly original to Aaron Aronofsky's own personal vision. This film explores a particular issue that could be considered as a hot topic, but thankfully it doesn't showcase it in any exploitative manner. It does not romanticise these eating disorders at all, nor does it paint Brendan Fraser's character as nothing but a helpless victim. He has done this to himself. He is acting in a self-destructive manner. It doesn't shy away from the inherent selfishness of the act of doing this to not only yourself, but to those around you. It's darkly comedic in ways that more crowd-pleasing movies wouldn't be towards this kind of subject matter. It's not afraid to shine light on the inherent comedy of the situation. It's appropriately dreary and miserable, but not so overbearingly depressing. It's not quite as hellish as Requiem for a Dream, for instance. There are hopeful sentiments in this film also. It is, however, when all said and done, a tragedy. An avoidable tragedy that the main character cynically allows to envelop him. Brendan Fraser deserves all of the acclaim he is receiving. This is certainly not a matter of something being overhyped. He just put everything into this character and his hard work paid off. Minor spoilers. This film opens with Brendan Fraser's character masturbating to gay porn, which I loved. Seeing someone masturbate is such a great way to look into their soul. You see them at their most vulnerable, at their most desperate and pathetic. It really helps to humanise a character for me. More directors should do it. People are going to think I'm taking the piss here, but I'm being 100% sincere. Commence the fap. Sadie Sink was decent, not brilliant. You could definitely see the cracks in her performance. She was playing a very similar type of person to her character in 
Stranger Things, this sassy young teen. The Whale might not be up there with some of Darren Aronofsky's best work, but it's certainly close. It's far more grounded than films like Requiem for a Dream or Black Swan. It's much closer to being like The Wrestler. And as of right now, I'd still say that I prefer The Wrestler, but who cares, you know, doesn't matter. I need to know that I have done one thing right with my life. <laughs> Number 7 grants us with Everything Everywhere All at Once. One of the most imaginative films to come out in years, a supremely better multiverse movie than Doctor Strange 2, stretches that concept to its full cinematic potential. This is what true, untethered imagination looks like. It's bizarre, perplexing, and in many ways frightening. Because this film can be quite freaky at times. What's more is that it contains some incredible fight choreography. If you're a fan of hand to hand action set pieces, this is definitely a must see. Those action scenes are shot so lavishly well. Clear, fluid, energetic, dynamic, just gorgeous stuff. It dealt with existential dread in a manner that I haven't seen any other film do quite so acutely. This is a prominent internal crisis I have with myself, so it was quite profound to see these ideas expressed on film. It did feel quite personal to me. It was beyond endearing to see Short Round return to play a character that essentially embodies optimism in the face of nihilism. Despite all of the craziness, this film still manages to have an extremely potent emotional core, which does lend for quite the tear-jerking experience. When it's wacky, it is fucking wacky, but when it's sad, I do think that it hits those tones just as potently. That emotional core makes this film more than just a proof-of-concept multiverse movie. It genuinely retains a contemplative story arc. Every rejection, every disappointment has led you here to this moment. At number six, we have Blonde, uh, wildcard bitches. This might be my most controversial placement. You already know that I like this film if you saw my review. On a technical level, this has some very experimental editing choices, all of which worked and had their intended effect on me. It's almost Lynchian in how experimental and strange it is. The cinematography is sensational, the score, which may be the best part about it, was transcendent. Anna de Armas put so much of herself into this role that it hurts. That's perhaps my favourite performance of 2022. Despite what people are saying about how this depicts Marilyn, it creates its own version of Marilyn that I had nothing but sympathy for. The best way to look at it, I think, is as an allegorical depiction of Marilyn Monroe to tell a broader story of the history of misogyny in Hollywood. I think if you look at it that way, it's a near masterpiece. Don't get me wrong, it's still rough around the edges and kind of indulgent but even all of the indulgent filmmaking techniques really resonated with me. Blonde provided the most visceral and unnerving experience of last year for me. I was in a really bad mood after watching it. This film was dreamlike, horrific, extreme, metaphorical, artistic, expressive, pungent. The Oscars don't mean anything to me anymore, but if I was in charge, I'd peg this for best lead actress, best cinematography, best editing, and best musical score. Fucking easily. Even with all the controversy, this film is just too goddamn special to sweep under the rug. Just pretend that it's a fictitious alternate reality world like with Under the Silver Lake or something. Also on a political level, apparently people think it's like a pro-life movie because of the way it depicts the abortion scenes. I actually really loved how it depicted those, they were horrific. This character was forced into having abortions by a bunch of men for the sake of upholding her celebrity status. It doesn't really get any more vile than that. How dare the filmmakers depict such a thing for as nightmarish as it is. This could go off on a tangent, but you know, like, how else do you shoot baby killing? doing another scene with Marilyn Monroe. At number five, we have Baby Lon. I came out of Babylon thinking it was a total masterpiece. In hindsight, I do not hold this opinion anymore, but it's damn close. The directing is staggeringly impressive. It's sublime in all technical departments. Editing, pacing, cinematography, musical score. The intricacies of some of the compositions in this film are vast. The biggest department in which this film is lacking is its characters. They weren't bad by any stretch 
the imagination, but they just weren't as human or as fleshed out as I'd have preferred them to be. If I'd had a firmer emotional bond with these characters, then I probably would have absolutely adored this film. This could be seen as a companion piece to Blonde, as it is an indulgent, unsanitized look at the awfulness of Hollywood. And I'd also compare it to Wolf of Wall Street in how it depicts excessive pursuits of gratification and pleasure. <laughs> Number four, we have The Banshees of Inner Sharon, Friendship Gone Wrong. The reason that this film is so high up on this list is because it near enough achieves everything it's set out to do. There's no fat, it holds your attention all the way through, it has a provocative and engaging message, its characters are familiar and relatable. Colin Farrell did a really good job at playing an idiot. It was believable, but not too cartoonish. Carrie Condon was also standout and completely set herself apart from her other roles, such as her Better Call Saul one. Brendan Gleeson once again delivered. It's not a particularly new performance for him, but it's still good. Barry Keegan, however you pronounce it, he will always have a seat at my table. I'm glad he was playing someone a little more innocent and sympathetic this time. The atmosphere of this film also adds to the experience, especially pertaining to the unique setting. I loved how it fully utilised its distinct location to complement the moods of the film. It's a slow and quiet character study, but it delivered on everything that it needed to, to be an engaging watch. It ended very memorably, and I walked out feeling that I'd simply watched a polished and well-made work of art. Now, if I've done something to you, just tell me what I've done to you. When you didn't do anything to me, I just don't like you no more. You liked me yesterday. Number three, we have Nope. I really should have done a review for this when I initially watched it because I really like this film, so sorry to deprive you of that. I also wanted to do an analysis video where I talk about all the themes and what it meant, but so many other people on YouTube are doing it. It kind of got absolutely rinsed, this film, in terms of people analysing it. So I kind of got demotivated to do that. Nope explained, Nope cracked, everyone was just fucking sinking their teeth into it. On the surface, Nope is a very odd film about a brother and sister trying to capture a UFO on camera. I'd say there's enough entertainment value in that alone for you to find the film gripping. Minor spoilers, I suppose. The direction that this film took with the alien was really inventive and cool. Really good twist. I don't know how to put my finger on it, but this film possesses the same sort of magic that Close Encounters did. Every ounce of this film was directed in this super specific, uncanny way that Jordan Peele seemingly has mastered. Already, he has established his own unique flair as a filmmaker. Right from the start, it manifests such a distinct atmosphere that makes every scene engaging. And then when it does get to the horror scenes, holy shit does it deliver. There are two scenes in particular that are masterfully done, both involving some form of animal, wink wink. There's one flashback sequence that some might say is oddly placed within the film's runtime, but that was not the case with me. For me, that gaudy sequence had something very important to add to this film, and it came at the right time. This film showed you everything you needed to see for you to get just enough of a sense of what it's driving at. The way in which the alien, should I say, consumed its victims brilliant, claustrophobic. The interior design of the alien is completely perplexing to what someone would expect. There's like nothing organic looking about it. The final form of the alien was beautiful and unexpected. You couldn't look away from it. It was so imaginatively conceived. Now there is a lot of intriguing subtext to this film, which is left ominously vague. Going out of my first watch, I enjoyed my time with the film, but I was eager to figure out what the whole thing was driving at. I was talking before about how I love films that don't explicitly say what they're about through dialogue. They just present a series of events to you and let you figure it out. Nope is a perfect example of this kind of cryptic thematic storytelling. Fucking loved it. It's my favourite Jordan Peele film to date. It's a new cult classic horror film that I'd liken to Don't Look Now and other weird shit from history. Films that you might not fully get on first viewing but their atmosphere alone leaves enough of an impression on you for you to have a full and unique experience. <laughs> But Logan Paul didn't like this film though, so there you go. That's okay if he doesn't like it. It's a weird film, it's not for everyone, who, who gives a shit? 
No, actually, it's uh, it's media illiteracy, Bacho. Jesus Christ, media illiteracy, really? Be careful with that. Be careful with that word, that term. That's the new, like, oh, bad take. This guy has a bad take. This guy's media illiterate. But number two, decision to leave. Out of every movie on this list, decision to leave might have the closest resemblance to being an utter masterpiece. This is Park Chan-wook's latest feature. He directed Old Boy and The Handmaiden, two other meticulous masterpieces. Decision to leave is perfection. So this is a South Korean crime thriller slash romance movie about a detective who falls in love with a murder suspect. I'm just going to leave it at that. First of all, the editing of this film is so intricately brilliant that it borders on innovative. There is no other film that possesses this style of extravagant but purposeful editing. It is out of this world. Plot-wise, this is astonishing and perfect. The same goes for the cinematography, the pacing, the dialogue. Every objective department of filmmaking it excels in. It's chaotic, unpredictable, gripping, quirky, intricate. The way in which it visually presents itself is endlessly energetic. It's honestly a visual marvel in every way. I have only seen this once, however, and I do definitely think that it merits a second watch similar to Old Boy and The Handmaiden, because it gives you a lot to think about. The only thing that holds this film back from being number one on this list is there is a slight lack of emotional attachment. The female lead was intentionally cold and distant, but I didn't care for this relationship relationship as much as the film expected me to. It's a tricky one. And finally, we have the number one spot. Oh, big boy. Oh, it's definitive. Oh, no one can argue with this once it's been said. Yeah. We're here now. Number one, After Sun. Okay. Badger has spoken! Badger has decreed! Again, I already did a review for this, but this is the most heartfelt, personal, and emotionally impactful film of the year. Therefore, I think it deserves the top spot. No need for extravagant cinematography or groundbreaking technical achievements. All this needs is the matter-of-fact, honest eye of the film lens. You turn the camera on and you film what is there. You film something authentic and raw. You photograph the photograph. Shebang. Wish we could have stayed for longer. Me too. It is the best movie, apparently. Done. Right. Ah, nice one. I can relax now. Jesus. Remember, again, you don't need to take this too seriously, right? Just calm down. It really doesn't matter that much. It was just a bit of fun. Fucking losers, honestly. Calm your tits. You might have spotted a recurring theme throughout all of my critiques of these different films, and that being the fact that I quite clearly prioritise good characterization and authenticity over everything else. I see films as an extension of the artist's soul, and if the artist is an insincere douchebag, the film will be this light, disgusting imposter piece of shit. It will not be wholesome and genuine, it'll be vapid. That's just how I look at things and it's very pretentious but that's kind of, I like it that way anyway so fuck off. It also seems that I'm partial to horror films but that might be because there's just a lot of really good horror films coming out this in the last couple of years. But yeah I enjoyed that strangely enough, it took a while to do, uh, it's going to take even longer to edit but I hope you enjoy it most of all baby. I really appreciate all of the support and the comments and the feedback. You guys are amazing. I know that's cliche to say, but it is true. I mean, I'm completely dependent on you watching, so it kind of, yeah, that's the truth of the matter, isn't it? All in all, that was a doozy, and I'm going to say goodbye to you now. So goodbye, and enjoy this new year as much as you can. God, what a positive sentiment to end on. Yeah, try and enjoy the new year, whatever. Get off the stage, you disgusting fat fuck. 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 Get off the stage, you disgusting fat fuck.